Okay. What's up, AI at UCF? This is Danny Silva. Uh, welcome to our meeting today. First off, I want to say I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this time. I think things have gotten a bit crazier than we all expected them to, so I hope everyone's staying safe and quarantined. Um, hopefully today's meeting gives everyone something to do while we're all at home quarantined. So um, let's get started then. So today we're going to be learning about something a bit different than we've looked at in previous weeks. So I just want to mention that if you haven't uh, been to any of our neural network related lectures in the past few weeks, um, don't worry, this meeting won't use any neural networks or gradient descent or anything of the sort. So um, I think this meeting should be pretty much good to go for everyone, uh, no matter what background you have. So that's a plus for today. Uh, so like all our previous uh, meetings, let's get started with a question to ponder. So how do humans learn from experiences? I want everyone to keep this in the back of their mind as we go through today's meeting. Um, and when we go to the workshop especially, try to think of some parallels between how humans actually learn and adapt from their, their experiences versus how we're going to actually enable a computer to learn from their experience, from its experiences. Um, so as you probably could have guessed through the title of today's meeting, uh, we're going to be looking at reinforcement learning today. So reinforcement learning is an old but up and coming area of AI. I think its origins come from around the 1950s, maybe the 60s. So it's pretty old, um, but recent advances, and specifically our hardware, have allowed reinforcement learning to really become a reality when applied in practice. So it does require a completely new way of thinking than sort of how we've been thinking or approaching machine learning problems um, this semester. So in reinforcement learning, we don't use a traditional data set like how we've been using in supervised machine learning. So in, in uh, RL, we have what's called an environment. Um, and in this environment, we'll also have an agent which acts on this environment. Um, and this environment must be explored. Um, and as this environment is explored, we want our agent to learn what's called a policy. Um, and a policy essentially will represent the agent's intelligence, really. And the policy will tell the agent what to do or what action to take in this environment in order to succeed in this environment. So the policy is really guiding the agent as it plays a game or interacts with the environment. Um, and as the environment is explored, this policy becomes better and better. And eventually what we do is begin to exploit the policy only. So we'll get, there's a bit of a trade-off between exploration and policy exploitation in reinforcement learning. Um, and that's a pretty big topic of discussion, so we'll touch on that a lot as the, as the workshop goes on. So a few downsides of reinforcement learning is it's really difficult to get right. So if, you ever, if anyone's ever tried to solve a reinforcement learning problem, you'll notice that it's a bit finicky. Um, and you really need a lot of, it has what's called poor sample efficiency. So what that means is really you need a lot of samples. You need the agent to play the game or go through its environment a lot, a lot of times until it actually learns a good enough policy to succeed in its environment. Um, it's also very sensitive to the hyperparameters. Uh, even more so than supervised learning. So there's a sorry, there's a typo there. There's no such thing as surprise learning. Um, so yeah, it's just a bit finicky. It's difficult to get right. But if you set up your environment correctly, um, if you use the correct algorithm, and you have enough time, a powerful enough machine to play the game or play the environment enough times, it will do. It will succeed eventually. So, so uh, one of our other coordinators, Jarvis, who isn't with us here today, put this meme up here. Uh, it goes, whenever someone asks me if reinforcement learning works, I tell them it doesn't. And 70% of the time, I'm right. So it's kind of funny joke there. If you've ever, if you've ever tried reinforcement learning, uh, you'll, kind of, you'll kind of understand that meme. <laughs> so let's get started. Let's start with a few definitions for reinforcement learning so we know what these terms mean as we go forward. So let's take Mario, for example. We're going to play the Mario game here. So Mario is our agent. I mentioned that we have an agent in reinforcement learning. So Mario is our agent in this case. Um, and the world that Mario plays in is its environment. I actually forgot the world that Mario, that Mario is in. There's a name for it, Mushroom Kingdom possibly. Um, but, so Mushroom Kingdom is our environment in this case. So in reinforcement learning, the agent, or our Mario in this case, can take actions within the environment. So when an agent takes an action in the environment, the environment will return 
the resulting state. So within the environment, there are a set of states that the agent could be in, which are really like the physical positions that the agent can be in within the environment or within the game. So this is a bit deceptive because Mario actually does start off in an initial state as well. So after Mario takes his first action, the, the environment will return his resulting state. And the environment also returns some reward. So for every action that the agent takes in the environment, the environment returns the state that the agent is now in and also a reward that the agent was given for taking that specific action from that specific state. So this is all a bit abstract right now. We have, we have Mario, the agent. Mario can perform actions within the environment, and the environment returns the reward and the resulting states. So, and there are a set of states that the agent can be in in this environment. So we need a way to actually like formally define this so that we can really code this up and allow a computer to understand this. Right now it's a bit abstract. So what we do is formalize this decision process as a Markov decision process. And what Markov decision processes allow us to do is formalize the decision-making process that an agent performs while acting in the environment. So a Markov decision process is really similar to what we've looked at before. It's just sort of a formal way of defining this decision process. So every Markov decision process has a set of states. So this is an example Markov decision process here. So our states are to starve, to be hungry, or to be full. Those are our three, uh, three defined states. Every Markov decision process also has a set of actions. In this case, these are the transitions in the state transition diagram. So in this case, the actions that we can take are eat or don't eat. Pretty simple there. And lastly, every Markov decision process, we'll call them MDPs from now on. Every MDP also has a reward function. And this reward function is what tells the environment how much reward to return based off the action that an agent took at its initial state. So this reward function for this Markov decision process is shown by these R's here. So if you take an action, uh, you'll also be returned a specific reward. So there are a few unique things about Markov decision processes that must remain applicable. And we sort of have to implement these in such a way that these remain true. So the first thing is that actions are, the first thing you should note is that actions are related to states. So really what that just means is you'll notice here that if you take the same action from two different states, the reward that's returned isn't always the same. So there's sort of this interaction between the action and the state and every unique action state pair has its own reward. Another assumption that Markov decision processes make are that all of your states are independent from one another. So what that really just means is that the action you take at a certain state won't affect the result of a, another state somewhere over here. They're independent from one another. We don't care about what state we were in 10 states ago. We only care about the state we're in right now. So that's sort of a baseline for what a Markov decision process is. So we want to formalize our RL problem, our reinforcement learning problem, as a Markov decision process with this set of states, actions, and of reward function. So I, I mentioned earlier that our main goal in reinforcement learning is to learn what we call the policy. In this case, the policy is represented by this state transition diagram here. And the policy is intuitively the agent's knowledge about the environment, and the policy is what's going to tell the agent what to do based on what state it's currently in in order to maximize the reward it's returned. So again, the policy is what's telling the agent what action to take given its current state in order to maximize some reward. So this policy in this case can be represented by this state diagram. So this state diagram has our complete list of states and at each state it has a transition which is telling us what action to take in order to maximize reward. We won't always we won't always like actually define our policy as this as a state transition diagram like this, but intuitively intuitively this is what's happening. You know, you're building this diagram which tells the agent at every state it could possibly be in what re what action to take. Right. So ultimately, we want to be able to learn this policy. So at this point, we have the definitions put down. We know what an, an NDP is. We know what our actions are, what our states are, what the agent does in its environment, and the reward that's returned. We know all about that. So the, and we know that our agent needs to learn a policy. 
So the only thing that we're missing now is how are we going to learn this policy. We need some sort of update rule or algorithm that allows us to learn this policy over time as the agent explores its environment. So that brings us to the Bellman equations. If you've ever done some research into reinforcement learning, you have definitely came across the Bellman equations. They're actually a, a bit involved and complicated. We probably need a lot more time to really go in depth into the Bellman equations. So we're just going to take a high level look at them so we have an intuition behind uh, the basis of what reinforcement learning is. So the Bellman equations, uh, these are made up by a mathematician something Bellman, his last name was Bellman, back in the 60s, I believe. And what these set of equations do is provide us a base approach or base algorithm to solving Markov decision processes. So that's why we had to formalize our reinforcement learning problem as an MDP, because these Bellman equations were made for MDPs. And they won't work unless our problem is really defined as an MDP which we're, in which we're following those rules we're, we define. So the states are independent, um, and each state action pair has its own unique reward. And from this set of equations uh, is where our broad range of reinforcement learning algorithms have been developed. So if you look at any reinforcement learning algorithm and compare it to the Bellman equation, you will see sort of the similarities. Um, later in today's workshop, we're going to learn about Q-learning, which is one specific algorithm um, so as we learn about the Bellman equation, try and think about when we're learning about Q-learning later, try and draw like the similarities and you'll see how similar they are. So a, just a quick glance at this Bellman equation. This equation represents the value of a state. So I hope you guys can see my cursor here. So this V represents the value of the state S given a policy. So the policy in this equation is always represented by the pi symbol here. So this, the equation represents the value of a state given a certain policy, because the policy is what's telling us the value of this state, right? So in order to leverage this equation, as the agent explores its environment, as the agent plays some game, given the agent's current state, we always want to move to the next state that will maximize our reward. And this equation is telling us that. This equation is allowing us to update our policy. So as, as we take actions which we think will maximize our reward, we update the value of the previous state based off re reward returned as well as the expected reward one step in the future. So that was a bit lengthy. So what this equation again is re representing is the value of a certain state. And as the agent moves about its environment, we're going to update the value of this state based on the reward that was returned as well as the expected reward one step in the future. So if we're, at step, if we're at state zero and we take some action to move to state number one, we update state's zero value based off the reward that was returned from moving from state zero to one, as well as the reward we expect to get if we take the best action from state one to state two, for example. So we're also looking sort of one step in the future uh, and this future value is dependent on our policy. Our policy is going to tell us, okay, we just moved to state number one. What action do we take in order to maximize reward? And we use that expected reward to update the value of state zero. So that's a high level look at how the Bellman equation works and really how a lot of reinforcement learning algorithms work as a whole. If you want to understand the in-depth math, uh, this link will take you to an article which breaks down the Bellman equations, derives it. There's really a set of Bellman equations. This is just sort of the ultimate derivation. Um, so if you want to understand the math in depth, it's a really cool article. I'd check it out if I were you guys. So some important notes about the Bellman equation before we move forward. So you see that we can express the value of states as values of other states. So they sort of build on top of each other as we explore the environment. So if you've taken um, any computer science courses and are familiar with dynamic programming, this might like sound familiar to you. Because in dynamic programming, if you're not familiar with it, what we do is break down some large problem into a set of smaller subproblems. And when we solve the set of smaller subproblems, we ultimately build the solutions on top of each other in order to find some global optimal, so globally optimal solution to this larger problem. 
So in practice, when you implement the Bellman equation or other reinforcement learning algorithms, it's usually done using dynamic programming. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the workshop today, is solving uh, a reinforcement learning problem using dynamic programming and the Q-learning algorithm, which is a bit different from the Bellman equation, but almost the same thing. You'll, uh, you'll see later on. Um, another note is reward doesn't necessarily have to be given at each action or after like every state transition. Sometimes it's only at certain states. Um, you don't necessarily have to return a, re return a reward after every action. And lastly, you see this gamma parameter over here. So gamma is a really important hyperparameter in this process, and this will come up later in the workshop as well with Q-learning. And gamma sort of defines the trade-off between exploration versus exploitation. So we're going to talk a lot about this in the workshop, but this trade-off uh, is introduced due to the fact that you can imagine that in the beginning of some game, or when the agent, when Mario has just started playing his game, he doesn't know much about his environment yet. He hasn't learned much about his environment or his game, and so his policy isn't very accurate yet. So if you were to just leverage the policy, or like sort of the agent's knowledge of what to do and when to do what, um, at the beginning of the game, it wouldn't do very well. So in the beginning of the game, or in the beginning of every reinforcement learning problem, what you do is explore the environment. And exploring really just means taking random actions. So this gamma value in the Bellman equation is defining what chance do we have to take a random action versus exploit our policy. So exploration means to take random actions, and exploitation means to exploit your policy, or exploit the knowledge that your agent has gained about its environment over time. So you can imagine in the beginning of the game, it's best to do a lot of exploration, and over time, as the agent learns more about its environment, you switch from exploration to exploitation. And towards the end of the game, you're 100% only exploiting your policy, which means taking actions which the agent thinks will be rewarding. Um, so gamma is what defines that. If gamma is 1, we're doing exploration. If gamma is a 0, we're doing exploitation. And as you play the game, this value reduces from 1 to 0 slowly at some rate that you define. So now we have Mario in his world, and we're just going to run through an example of how the Bellman equation sort of works in practice. It's a bit, it's a bit simplified, um, but it'll give you guys some idea of how the co a computer learns from its experiences. So at this point, Mario had just started his game. Mario knows his goal. His goal is to get to Peach. However, he doesn't know where Peach is, and he doesn't know what actions will lead him to Peach. He has no idea. So his policy has just been instantiated. He hasn't learned anything. The policy is, without a better word, dumb. So Mario, at this point, is exploring his environment. He's taking random actions, hopefully, hopefully learning a little bit of, of the environment with every random action he takes and eventually he'll learn enough to where he can exploit his knowledge and get to Peach. So in the beginning, we instantiate every state value with a zero. So every state has its own value, as in the Bellman equation, and the start off is all zero. So this is what I mean by he knows nothing about his environment. The policy is, has just been created. Um, all the states have a value of zero. So let's say that, OK, and also we have to define the reward function. So if he reaches Peach, he gets a reward of 1. If he reaches Bowser, he's given a negative reward of a negative one. So you see that reaching Bowser gives you a negative reward, sort of a bad thing, and reaching Peach gives you a positive reward, which is a good thing, and that will allow the agent to realize, hey, I, this set of actions I've take succeeded, let me try and replicate that. So we have our policy instantiated, and we have a reward function. So at this point, Mario can begin to exp explore his environment. So let's say that Mario decides to randomly go down here and then to the right a little bit to the right and then oops, he hits Bowser. So at that point what happens, we call our Bellman update equation and we update the, the uh, value of each of the states he's encountered thus far. Um, and this update rule takes into account the reward he's received, right? So we define gamma as 0.5 um, and n equals 1 just means we're playing the game one time. So in order to update the, the value of these states, you just take the reward that's, that was returned fr from the state that resulted in hitting Bowser and multiply it by gamma. So the state that's right next to Bowser gets a value of negative 0.5 because it's the negative 1 reward multiplied by that gamma. 
in order to update the next state, you take the reward of this state in the future, remember, and multiply it by gamma as well. I went the wrong way. So that gets negative 0.25, and then you can imagine what happens to the next state. It's also multiplied by 0.5, and we, we can round that off to 0.13. So at this point, Mario has some idea of the expected re uh, reward for reaching these states. So I mentioned that as you play the game in order to exploit the policy, you take the action which uh, the agent thinks will return him the most reward, or maximize the reward function. So Mario is now going to know to avoid these states so he won't hit Bowser. So next time, he'll know to avoid those states, and let's say he accidentally, he'll, he'll kind of miss Peach a little bit, but ultimately he'll hit Peach, knowing to avoid those states with, which resulted in hitting Bowser. So now we can update those states. So similarly, the state, the, the state right before hitting Peach is updated to the reward that was returned multiplied by our gamma. At this point also I should mention N is 2. This is our second time like sort of playing the game. Mario died when hitting Bowser, so we restart and play it again. And then the update rule is, as, is similar to before, but now all of these states are going to be positive because Peach returned us a positive reward. And so we go along multiplying each uh, previous state by 0.5, and we sort of chain them backwards like this. And now all of these states have a reward, have some positive reward. The state right next to Peach obviously having the highest reward because the agent should know to reach states near Peach in order to eventually reach Peach. And so this is what happens after just two iterations of the game. So if we make n equal a lot, like a thousand games. 100,000 games, something like that, this is eventually what our state value table will look like. So states nearby Bowser will have really, really large negative expected rewards, whereas states that frequently lead to hitting Peach will have large positive expected rewards. And at this point, Mario has a really intelligent policy. He's learned a lot about his environment. And at this point, he can just totally exploit the policy he's learned. And if your policy is good enough, exploiting the policy means you're going to pretty much reach the goal every time. So that's like sort of in short how reinforcement learning works. We're going to get into, a, into it a lot deeper in the workshop and actually code this up. Um, just to take a look at like a better example of this stuff. Uh, this is a really cool demo created using Unity. Um, if you ever use Unity, hats off to you. Um, but uh, you can see here that this is implementing the same function. This is actually using Q learning, but you can see the dissimilarity to the Bowman equation already. So there's an epsilon value. Epsilon is our is our, the same thing as gamma. And you can see that when it's uh, epsilon started off as one, so it was totally doing random actions, exploring the environment. Um, and as the agent plays the game, Epsilon is slowly reduced to zero, which means he's going to be slowly exploiting his policy more and more. Um, and you can actually see, it's kind of minute, but you can, if you just watch the agent, which is the blue box, by the way, if you want to watch the agent move around, the more games that he plays, you'll see that his actions sort of start to become less and less random. He's, he's being able to go straight to the goal, like much faster without going to a bunch of random places. And that is that trade-off between exploration and exploitation visualized. So in the beginning, if this was to restart, he would be going pretty randomly all around the environment until he started to realize, like, going to the left made me hit the, uh, the goal, which is the, the green box there. And now that Epsilon is really low, he's pretty much reaching the goal every time. And you can see how I just restarted the environment. You see how it's pretty random right now. And pretty quickly, he'll start to realize that going sort of right and down a little bit reaches the goal. This is just a really cool visualization. You can make different environments if you want. And it's really just visualizing the learning process. Cool. So we should have a baseline of how reinforcement learning works, at least intuitively now. So let's try and code it up. Get rid of this stuff. If you guys do have any questions, you guys can just pop them in our Discord, by the way. I'll be available this whole week. Okay. So let's open up our notebook. Um, 
I'm actually not aware if we have a Kaggle notebook ready for this workshop yet for you guys, although this notebook is on uh, GitHub. So if you just clone our repo, you can either run this on your computer locally or you can download the notebook and upload it to Colab um, and you can just run it on Colab. Our website also might have links already generated for Colab and Kaggle. So you guys can just open up those links, create your own uh, like uh, copy of the notebook and run it on Kaggle or uh, Colab, either one. I'm using Colab here. Um, so we're going to be using OpenAI's Gym Library for this reinforcement learning workshop. If you're not familiar with OpenAI, uh, it's a really cool company that it's like a research oriented company that was started a few years ago whose goal at first was to make AI research, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, like accessible to the general public. And they wanted to ensure that AI technologies were not monopolized by large corporations. Um, so that's, was, that was OpenAI's original like statement or goal statement um, for which they created their company. Um, and now they, they have a lot of really cool projects going on. I'm pretty sure OpenAI is, Open AI is uh, who created the reinforcement learning system that beat uh, the best Dota team in the world. Um, and they, had, they have a lot of similar successes like that. Um, so OpenAI has a library called Jim. And Jim provides a few, or really more than a few, several, I think close to 30 or 40, um, pre-made environments that we can train a reinforcement learning policy on and actually visualize how we're doing in that environment. So it's kind of just like provides a bunch of different games that we can train agents to play. So one of the games in OpenAI's Jim library that we can train an agent to play is what's called the mountain car game. So you should always get to start off by importing your libraries. And we can talk a little bit about this, this uh, OpenAI Jim mountain car game now. So this is a pretty classic reinforcement learning problem. And our goal is to create an algorithm or really train a policy that enables a car to climb up a steep mountain. Um, and the key point of this game is that the car's engine is not powerful enough to drive directly up the mountain. Uh, the car starts off at the bottom point of the hill here, hill here every time, I'm pretty sure. And it's not powerful enough to just drive straight up, or that'd be pretty simple, right? So because of this, the car is going to need to utilize uh, the left mountain, and really ultimately both uh, mountains, in order to gain enough momentum slowly to where uh, it can drive up the right side of the hill using its own momentum. So this, uh, these commands here make your environment. Uh, I don't actually think you need, you don't need to seed it, but if you do seed if you do seed your, your notebook, it'll make sure that it runs exactly how mine did. Um, the key thing you need to run is this gym.make method, which just makes uh, your environment. In this car, we're making the mountain car version zero environment. So run that, and your environment object should, cr should be created in this env variable. And now there are a bunch of attributes and methods we can utilize that OpenAI has already coded up for us. So in order to interact with these gym environments, we're going to need to understand a few things. So every environment has what's called an action space. And as we know from, pre from previously, uh, every markup decision process has a set of actions it can take. So in this case, if we print the attribute action space from this environment, it prints this discrete object of three. OpenAI has like a list of their own data structures that they've made. So this discrete data structure is essentially representing a list of three discrete um, actions that agent can take. So in this case, these actions I know are move left, stay in place, or move right for the, for the car in this environment. So there's three discrete actions it can take. Nothing, you can't go in between. You can't sort of move halfway between stay in still or go right. You either move left, Stay in place or move right. That's why they're discrete and not continuous. So in practice, you apply an action using environment.step. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. So if you were to step in the direction of an action from this action space, the action would then be applied to the car. And as we know from before, this results in a new state, which the environment returns for us. So in this mountain car environment, the car's current state is simply made up of its, of its posi current position and current velocity. Uh, OpenAI likes to call states observations. So if you see observation, it really means state in this case. So you can print the environment's observation space, and you can see that there is this box 
uh, data structure in a box always has continuous variables and there are sort of two uh, variables within the environment's observation space. Like I mentioned, it's the position and velocity. That's why it's this data structure box with two inside it. There's two uh, elements of each uh, state. That is position and velocity. So if you print the low end of the observation space, you can get the minimum uh, position and minimum velocity the car can be at. Uh, so if you print that out, the first thing here that I'm highlighting results in a length to observation space, obviously, and this is signal signaling the lower bound of the observation space. So we can see that the minimum position the car can be in is negative 1.2. I don't know like the uh, the metrics. It's just sort of negative one. I don't know if it's centimeters or what, but negative 1.2, and the minimum velocity the car can have is negative 0.07. Uh, on the flip side, if we print out the high bound or the, the the top, the upper bound of the observation space, we see that the furthest position the car can be in is 0.6, and the fastest velocity it can have is 0.07. Uh, so we know from our Markov decision process slide that we need to have a set of actions and a set of states. So we have those. The last thing we need is the environment's reward function. So I know from reading up on OpenAI's documentation that re the reward function for the mountain car game is really simple. For every step that the car does not reach the goal, the environment returns a reward of negative one. So if you take any action and you don't reach the goal in that action, you get a reward of negative one. So if you take 100 steps in this environment, take 100 actions, and by the end of those 100 actions, you still haven't hit the goal, you have a reward of negative 100. So for every action that you take that does not result in you hitting that uh, goal position, you get a reward of negative one. I don't think I mentioned it, but position uh, 0.5 and above signals success. So you see that the furthest position the car can be at is 0.6. So anywhere above 0.5 results in success in this in this uh, game, and that would be right at this like flag up here, position 0.5. So now that we know uh, what actions we can take, how to apply an action, and what the reward function is, we can test this game out with some random actions. So if we were to apply random actions, what, would, what are we doing? We're exploring the environment. We're doing complete exploration of the environment. So for this, we're going to play 100, or sorry, 1,000 mountain car games. In each mountain car game, we take 200 steps. So OpenAI actually lets you define a maximum amount of actions or steps that you can take in the environment before just failing completely. So in this case, we're going to take 200 steps max, and if we don't hit the goal in 200 steps, that results in a failure. So we have 200 attempts, basically, to reach that goal. And then these variables here we're going to use to keep track of what's been going on as we play games. So we're going to count the amount of times the car uh, reaches the goal, and we're going to also count the furthest position the car reaches in every game, as well as the total reward that Agent uh, got for playing that game too. And those are going to be kept track in these lists here. So I'm going to run this, and it's going to take, so, oops, sorry, it's going to take a second. So as this runs, uh, I'm going to explain what's going on in the code here. Because this, this for loop is going to actually be used later throughout this whole workshop, so it's good for you guys to understand. So we're going to play each episode. So for each episode, uh, we initialize the, the furthest position the car has been in to the leftmost position, obviously, so negative 0.4, and we reset the environment. And we, init, we create this variable called done, which is going to tell us have we uh, reached the goal or have we used our maximum amount of steps yet. If we haven't, we keep going. So if we're not done, we keep running the episode. So in the episode, while we're not done, we select a random action. This env.actionspace.sample method lets you sample a random action from the environment's action space. So this is telling us randomly, are we going to go left, right, or stay in place? And then once we've selected the action, we execute the action by calling environment.step. And every time you step in uh, an open AI environment, it returns you four things. It returns you the state that, that you're now in, so the next state. It returns you the reward you got. It returns you your done variable, so done tells you either have you reached the goal or have you 
took in 200 steps. So done will tell us that. So we can use this done variable over and over to tell us uh, if we succeeded or if we've run out of steps to take. And then info is also an additional variable that we won't be using, so don't worry about that. So the state is that to, that length to vector where the first element in the vector is the position and the second element in the vector is the velocity. So we can retrieve the car's current position after taking an action just by getting the first element in that state vector right there. And then we, tr we keep track of the furthest position the car has gotten to. So if the current position we're now in is greater than the position that we started out at, which is, or sorry, if the position that we're now at is greater than the furthest position we've reached thus far, we update the furthest position. And then we also track the reward we got. Um, and this happens all for one episode. So when this while loop breaks, that means we finished the, uh, an episode. And at that point, we can track the amount of reward the agent, re agent received in that episode and also the furthest position the car got to in that episode. What, an episode is just one game, like one iteration of playing the game. Um, and also for every iteration, we're also going to check if the furthest position we got to is greater or equal to 0.5, that means we succeeded. So we're gonna tr track that as a success. So at this point, your code should also be done running. Uh, go, you can go ahead and run these. You can follow, follow along with me if you'd like and run these with me. So this block of code here will just uh, plot out uh, some of these things that we've kept track of here. We're also doing like a rolling mean. So the orange uh, line here is the rolling average of the car for this position and the car's reward. So you can see in the position graph, this is extremely random as expected. So the car is randomly, sometimes it randomly reaches like point negative or negative 0.15, which is still like not even close to the goal. Most of the time it doesn't even get close. And then the reward is at a steady negative 200. So if you if you recall what the reward function means, this means that every single time uh, we played an episode, we got a reward of negative 200, which means in every episode we were taking 200 steps, none of which were resulting in a success. So if every, state, if every step that we take results in a reward of negative one, then obviously if we take 200 steps and we don't succeed, our reward for that episode is negative 200. So that's why we have a, st a straight line here of just negative 200. And we see here that we resulted, we got zero successful episodes. So probably as you guys expected, using random actions doesn't work too well. But I wanted to do this so we have an idea of basically how to use OpenAI's gym library. And you guys can refer to this block of code here if you want to implement anything on your own. This is just the basic stuff that you need to perform actions and receive reward and resulting states in OpenAI. So now let's take a look at how to actually make our agent intelligent. And I've mentioned before, for this, we're going to be utilizing the Q learning algorithm. This is one of the most simple, and I would venture to say probably by far the most common reinforcement learning algorithm. And we're gonna use this algorithm to learn a policy for our mountain car game. So remember, intuitively, the policy we learn is essentially a function which can tell us what action to take next, given the current state in order to maximize reward. So the policy is just basically the, the decision maker in the agent's head that's running at all times. So in order to use Q learning, the first thing you need to do is actually bucketize your environment. Because uh, remember that in a Markov decision process, you need a discrete set of states. And right now in this environment, the state space is continuous, which means like the car could theoretically be at any position because the position and velocity are floats. So you could have like any arbitrarily precise position and velocity. So rather than having this continuous state space, we're gonna bucketize this. So this, uh, this is, we imported NumPy above here as NP. So that's why you see NP there. So NumPy has this function called linspace. And what this generates is an array uh, with 20 essentially buckets from the lower bound to the upper bound you give it. So we're generating 20 position buckets and 20 velocity buckets. So these buckets will make up our discrete state space that we're actually gonna train our policy on. So once we have these, these position buckets and velocity buckets, we can then create, we can make uh, this function called get state. And this is going to take an observation from OpenAI gym and transform this continuous state into our bucketized state. 
So if we give, if we say that the car is currently at position 2.22222 and velocity 1.22222, whatever, it's going to sort of round those off and put the uh, state in the correct buckets. So it's going to return us a tuple, which represents the the position bucket it's the state was in and velocity bucket the state was in. So again, these could be from zero to 20, both of them. So if you think about it, if we have 20, really, I'm pretty sure uh, this returns 21 buckets. I think both of these are included. So like, let's pretend that there are actually only 20 buckets. If you think about it, if there are 20 position buckets and 20 velocity buckets, how many actual states could the car be in, in the environment? 400, the 20 times 20. So there are 400 unique states that our car could be in. So here we're just creating the list of states that the car could be in. So there should be around f really, I think I looked at this earlier, there's actually 21 buckets that this function will create if we pass it 20. So there's gonna be like 21 squared states actually. So this is, this is just a list of states that we could be in where position and velocity represent the bucket number of that state. So finally we can initialize our Q table. So our Q table contains a key for each state action pair. Recall that I told you guys that uh, rewards are, are tied to state action pairs, meaning you can't take the same, the same action at two different states and expect the same reward. So every state action pair has its own expected reward. So the Q value in Q learning the Q value itself represents the expected reward from taking a certain action from a given state. So if you recall the Bowman equation, that's really similar to a state's value. The Q value represents the expected reward for taking a certain action from a given state. That's like by far the most important thing to remember about Q learning. The Q value represents the expected reward, so the reward we expect or predict we're going to get from taking a certain action at our current state. So what we do is we create our Q table, which is going to represent the expected Q value for each of our 400 plus states. So for each of our states, for each action we can take, there is a, each, there's a unique state action pair. So if we have 400 states and three actions, how many state action pairs do we have? How many unique combinations of states and actions can we make? It'd be like 1,200. So there are going to be 1,200 unique Q values in our Q table, each of which represent, again, the expected reward from taking one of the three actions from one of our 400 states. And we initialize each of these Q values with zero, because again, our, our policy, this Q table is our policy. Each Q value represents the expected reward, and the, the Q table as a whole is our policy. So we, we look at this policy, this Q to, we look at this Q table to tell us what action to take that is going to maximize our reward. So at this point, we have a basic idea of what a Q value is and we have our Q table or our policy instantiated with all zeros. So again, the Q values represent the expected reward from taking one of our three actions from one of our 400 states. So in order to maximize reward, which is our, the agent's goal always, is to maximize reward, uh, in order to do this, at each step, we take the action which we predict will give us the most reward. So to do this, to, to take the action which we think will give us the most reward, we actually need to write a function which can look at our Q table, look at the current state we're in, and tell us what action is gonna give us the most reward from this current state. So we're just going to write a simple function here that takes in our policy, which is our Q table, Q, our current state, and a set of actions. So our set of actions are going to remain stable. Zero, in this case, means move left. One means stay in place, and two means move right. So this max action function is going to look at our Q table, look at the current state we're in, and then for each action we can take, we create an array which lists out the rewards that we could be given from taking an each of the three actions from this current state. So again, it looks at our current state, which is a single state, and it looks at each of the three actions we can take. So this function is going to return us the action which will return us the highest reward given our current state. Let me make sure I'm running these. 
make our buckets, make our or define our function that's going to return us our buckets from the continuous state space, and then create a list of possible states. From this list of possible states, initialize our queue table with our state action queue value pairs. State action pairs, which each state action pair has a queue value. And then finally, we define our function, which is going to allow us to retrieve the best action given our current state. This is all, that's all that is. This function is just giving us the best action from our current state. It says we're in this state. We have three choices. Which of these three choices are going to give us the most reward? And then it returns that number. So we have our queue, we have our queue table initialized, our policy initialized. Uh, we have a way to retrieve the best action. The last thing we need is a way to actually update these queue values as we play the, the uh, mountain car game. So this algorithm is actually what enables our, our car to learn from its experiences. So this is the, the Q value algorithm. If you look at it, it, it actually is super similar to the Bellman equation. And there's a reason why. Is the Bellman equation gives us that foundation for solving Markov decision processes. So the Q value, the Q algorithm, is just like an extension of the Bellman equation. So let's look at how it works. It looks a bit scary, but we're going to break it down. It's not scary at all. So again, this algorithm is our update rule. So every time we take an action in the environment, we use this algorithm to update the Q value at that state. So if we're at state, if we're, our current state is ST here. You can see the variable here. Um, and action is the action we took at that state. So if we're at state 0 and we take an action, we update state 0's Q value. So if you take an action from your current state, you update that state's Q value. That's, that's important there. So every time we take an action in the environment, we call this function. And what this function does is update the Q value based off of the current Q value. So this Q sub state action pair, that's the current Q value at this state action pair. So, so the equation go, is as follows. The current Q value plus a learning rate. So similar to, uh, sorry, so similar to uh, a lot of our deep learning approaches, we also have a learning rate, which is just going to affect how quickly we want to update these Q values. With a really small learning rate, every step we take, the Q value is going to be updated just a little bit. And if we have a really big learning rate, after every step we take, we're going to update that Q value a lot. So we take a step, then we update that state's uh, current Q value with the previous value plus a learning rate multiplied by, here's the important part of the equation, the reward we, the reward we receive from taking that action plus, here's the discount. The discount factor is just going to affect how much we want to weight uh, the future value estimate. So the reward we got from that taking that action plus this discount factor multiplied by our future value estimate. So this max Q state plus one sub action, or comma action, this just means if we're at state zero and we take an action and now we're at state one. State one is now our current state. So now we look at our policy and say, uh, what action do we expect or do we predict we're going to want to take from this new state? And this max Q is just getting that reward. So we, every time we take a step in the environment, very similar to the Bellman equation, we update the Q value with the reward we got from taking that action, as well as the reward we expect to receive from taking an action from that future state that we just got into. It's like, it's like a bit wordy. It's kind of hard to like word all of this. Um, but we basically want to look at the reward we got from taking that action, as well as the reward we expect to receive one step in the future now. And all of that is applied in this equation, which allows us to update our Q value from that state we just took an action from. So that's sort of the update rule behind Q learning. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, if each Q value is initialized to zero, then what action do we take to start off? There's no reward. There's no action that's going to return us a maximum reward if all of our expected rewards are zero right now. So this is where epsilon greedy action selection comes into play. And epsilon greedy action selection is really just this uh, trade-off between exploration and exploitation. 
So again, in the beginning of the environment, when we haven't uh, yet learned much about the environment, we explore the environment, which means we're going to take random actions. And this allows the agent to really just explore the environment and slowly learn what actions work well and what actions don't work well. And as, we, as our agent becomes more intelligent, as the, the agent learns more about its environment, our Q values become more accurate and we can actually rely on these predictions. We can rely on our Q values to actually tell us what actions to take. And these actions are actually going to be successful if our policy, if our Q table is accurate enough. So this action selection, this epsilon greedy action selection policy is really just this trade-off between exploring and exploiting. So if you, re if you again, if you read into reinforcement learning, you're, you'll be sure to hear more about exploration versus exploitation. It's an integral part of many RL algorithms. So to actually code up this technique, we use this variable epsilon, which is where epsilon greedy action selection comes into play. So epsilon was also, I think it was called gamma in the Bellman equation. But this epsilon is, is what is going to define whether we explore or whether we exploit. So in our code, we'll, you'll, you'll see here down below, epsilon is initialized to 1 and can go as low as 0. So when epsilon is 1, we're going to take totally random actions. So when epsilon is 1, we're exploring. And as we play more mountain car games, we slowly reduce this number until it reaches 0. And at 0, we're going to be relying 100% on our policy, on our Q table, to tell us what to do next. So that's called exploiting, exploiting your policy. And when epsilon is 0.5, for example, so in the middle of 1 and 0, we take half random actions and half actions which our policy tells, tell us are going to be good. So that's, where, that's basically epsilon greedy action selection, is you use epsilon to tell you whether you want to greedily, greedily use a random action or whether you want to exploit your policy. So now that we understand what our Q table is and how to update our Q table using this algorithm, let's go ahead and code it up. So we're going to run a, we're going to run this algorithm on 2,000 mountain car games. Sorry, and what you'll actually realize is if you try and run the mountain car game with just 200 steps, like we did up here, uh, 200 steps isn't really enough for the car to succeed at first. So it's going to have a really tough time learning. So we're actually going to allow it to take 1,000 steps per episode now. Like I said, epsilon is initialized to 1. Gamma, which is that discount factor here, <clears throat> is initialized to 0.99. That's a good standard value. That isn't going to change. And our learning rate is initialized to 0.1. So those are just good sort of arbitrary values you can use. Again, these are all hyperparameters. So gamma and learning rate are two things that you could tune sort of fiddle with to see if you can improve performance, but these should work for us. So then again, we, we you tell our environment that we can now take a thousand steps and we define our, our history lists. So at this point, we're finally ready to train a policy using Q-learning. So I'm gonna start running this. And again, I'm gonna sort of explain what's going on here. So for each episode, we're just going to print out what's going on. So we're going to print out the episode we're on, the, the, the running reward we have for that episode, and what our epsilon is at. So whether we're taking random actions, exploring, or whether exploiting. So before we, st bef before we start each episode, we just uh, re we reset the environment and get the initial state. So when you start off in the environment, the first thing you always do is do your epsilon greedy action selection. So if none of what I explained made sense, this should make a lot more sense. So epsilon starts off as one. So, and this uh, numpy.random.random .random method gives us a random number, random float between zero and one. So if epsilon starts off as one and numpy random is giving us a random value between zero and one and epsilon is one, what's the chance that this random number is less than one? 100%, because this random function can only give us numbers between 0 and 1. So that's how we apply this exploration versus exploitation trade-off is with this epsilon value. So when epsilon is 1, we're taking 100% random actions. So we call this action space dot sample method again, and this gives us a random action. When epsilon starts to decrease, when it's closer to 0, we'll see that the chance of this random number between being zero between 0 and 1 the chance that that number is greater than epsilon starts to become greater and greater as epsilon is decreased. 
So the closer epsilon gets to zero, the greater chance we have of exploiting our policy. And when we exploit our policy, we call that function that's going to return us the best action. So this max action function, again, takes our policy, which is our Q table, and the current state we're in, which we got from right here. So at this point, we've chosen an action. It's either a random action or it's an action that our policy tells us is going to work based on the current state we're in. So once we've retrieved an action, we apply that action, and again, we, we get the next state we're in, the reward, and whether we're done or not. So again, we can track uh, our max position, and we can track the reward we got. In order to apply Q-learning, we then need to bucketize the state. This next OBS variable is the state that OpenAI gives us with those continuous position and continuous velocity. So we take that continuous uh, state, apply it to our getState function, and that's going to bucketize our state and give us just the state numbers from 0 to 20 for both position and velocity. So now we're in one of our 400 states. <clears throat> And now we can actually perform our update rule. So all of this that we've seen so far was similar to our random functions from above. The only thing that we're going to do now is actually update our policy as we play the game. So in order to update our policy, I mentioned that one thing we need is the maximum reward for one, uh, for one step in the future. So that was like kind of confusing when I was trying to explain it. All that means is that we take uh, the state that we just got into we're in, we're in like this state right now, we get an action, apply it, and that results in this next state. So we take this next state and pass it to our policy and get the action that, we're, that we would like to take from this next state we're in, and that is what we use in our algorithm right here. So now we have everything we need to apply this algorithm. So, what, so again, how does the Q-learning algorithm work? Well, we update the Q value for the state that we were in previously to taking this action. So that's this state up here. The state that we were in before taking the action, that's the Q value we update. So the Q value for this state is now its current Q value. So look at, look at what we coded up. Look how similar this is to this algorithm. So the current value, that's this, plus the learning rate times this bit in the parentheses. So that's times the reward we got. You can see that here. The reward we got is the reward for taking an action from this state that we were just in. And that's given to us by OpenAI. So we then add reward to this last bit here. So gamma is our discount factor. That's 0.99 always. Multiplied by this confusing part, the future value estimate. So all the future value estimate is the reward that we expect to receive from taking this next action from this next state that we're now in. So one step in the future, what's the reward we expect to receive based on our policy? So after we apply this action, we're in this next state, we get the best action given this next state, and then we pass this next action to our Q table. So if, you, if we give this uh, state action pair to our Q table, this is going to return the reward we expect to receive from taking this next action at this next state. So that's this future value estimate. It's just the reward we expect to receive one step in the future. And the last thing we do is subtract again the current value. So it really wasn't that hard to code up at all. As long as you know to retrieve this future value estimate and then apply the algorithm correctly, it's really quite simple in implementation. So again, let's go through it one more time. As long as we're not done in this episode, we select, a random, we select an action with epsilon greedy action selection. So we either take a random action or exploit our policy to tell us what action to take, apply the action, track the reward, then get the next action that we, we should take in the future, and then update the Q value for that previous state. And then we just document what happened in this episode and document if we succeeded or not. So this is done now. You see that you see how epsilon decreases over time. So epsilon at first was 1 after 100 episodes it's 0.9 and after 2000 episodes it reaches 0 0.01. Down here is actually where I, I lower epsilon. You see that I actually bound it at 0 0.01. So no matter no matter what 
there's always at least a 1% chance of taking a random action. At least one. Uh, so we're always just a, doing a little bit of exploration. So we're not, if we weren't, if we didn't do this, then we, at some point we would be only exploiting our policy. And at that point we would ruin any chance of like exploring or learning new things about the environment. If that intuitively makes sense. So this is done and we can print out how we did now. So you see that with this pretty simple algorithm, really the only thing that changes, we had to make this Q table and update the Q values over time with this, with this uh, algorithm. With this really simple approach, we actually now succeed in over 1,700 episodes. So out of our 2,000 total episodes, this is actually an 86% success rate, uh, which is pretty good, actually. Better than I expected us to do, actually. So you see, let's like observe what happened here. In the beginning on the x on the yeah, x axis on both these plots that's our episodes and then for the first plot here this is plotting the furthest position the car gets to every episode and the bottom plot here is plotting the reward that uh, the car got in total for each episode. So you see that in the first 300 episodes or so the car moves a bit randomly. Um, it does start to reach 0.5 a few times here. Remember, the orange line is our, is our uh, rolling average. So it reaches the furthest position a few times here, but not every time. It starts off like doing not too hot, and then slowly over time, it begins to reach that, that goal state, which is 0.5 in position begins to reach that uh, goal position uh, more and more every time. And after like 400 episodes or so, it pretty much succeeds every time. So this intuitively sort of tells you that the, the, the car needs to more or less randomly come across its goal a few times in order to realize like, hey, this set of actions worked pretty well, let me start replicating that. And then it will begin to succeed every time. But for, for the first 100 episodes, it's really just learning. So it's failing a few times. Over time, it's succeeding more and more. And the reward follows this trend. Again, if we take 1,000 steps uh, in this episode and after, in this uh, game and don't succeed, the reward is negative 1,000. Because remember, we're getting a reward of negative 1 every time we take a set that does not succeed. The, the reward starts off as negative 1,000 every time, and as you would expect, over time, the reward becomes higher and higher. Because of the nature of the OpenAI function, this reward is never going to be positive, because the first time the agent is ever like, positively rewarded is when the game is done. But we can see here, based off the reward, that once the policy is pretty accurate, it takes anywhere from 400 to 200 steps for the car to reach the goal. Which is, which is a bit long, but it's, that, that's higher than the, 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 by default, the, the mountain car game lets you take 200 steps. So it's a bit long, but that's how we're doing so far. Um, so that's the Q learning algorithm at its base level. Right, so we did pretty good, 86% win rate. It took around 300 episodes to learn an efficient policy. And after that, we succeeded in the environment in roughly 300 uh, steps every time. We can tell that from these plots here. So these results are certainly better than our random action attempt from above, right? But we could actually do much better. So if you can recall, I've talked about this a lot already, but by default, the mountain car environment returns a reward of negative one for every step that did not result in success. So I want you guys to start thinking about possible shortcomings to this approach. Like, is there any information in the car's current state that we could take advantage of in order to create a better reward function? And think about why this reward function is pretty bad at first. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. Before we try and improve this, actually, let's take a look at how we can visualize the policy. So our policy, again, is that Q table that we defined above, which has a, which has a Q value, which is the expected reward for taking an action at a state. For every state action pair, we have a Q value. So we can actually plot this policy really easily. I'm not going to go into the code here. This is a little bit less important. If you want some explanation of what's going on here, 
Again, just pay me on Discord and I'll help you guys out. But to visualize the policy, what I do is plot uh, the action that our policy is telling us to take on this plot here, where the x-axis represents the position and the velocity represents, or sorry, x-axis is position, y-axis is velocity. So there's around like 400 unique st uh, states that we can be in here. So for each uh, for each uh, state, I call this max action and return the p the action that our policy would be telling us to take at this state and plot that. So you can see here that the green the green represents that our policy told us to move right, blue represents that our policy told us to move left, and red is uh, means that our policy told us to do nothing at each position velocity pair. So you can see that the policy decides to move the car to the left, usually when the car is already moving to the left. So again, velocity is on the y-axis here. So you can see that when velocity is negative, so like the lower part of this plot here, for the most part, the policy tells us to move left, which is, cor which is correct. This decision process allows us to sort of begin to leverage that left hill. So it's basically saying if the car is already moving to the left, which is the negative velocity here, the, pol the policy is telling the car to keep moving to the left. So that's sort of letting us climb as far up that hill as we can. On the other hand, when the car is already moving to the right, so a positive velocity, the top half of this plot here, for the most part, the policy is telling us to move to the right. So this works well. Again, this is what's allowing the car to take advantage of the momentum gained from the left hill. So it's sort of like climbing all the way up the left hill, try and, try and go all the way up. If it doesn't work, then go all the way back up the left hill and keep trying again. However, if you really pay attention, you'll notice like a strange interaction between the car's position and the policy. So it seems to slightly favor moving to the right, which is green dots here, when the car is further to the left. So you'll see it's, it's pretty minute, um, but on the left side of the graph is when the, the position is negative. So you see that there's slightly more green, which means move to the right, on the left side than the right side, which is pretty inefficient. If you think about it, it's basically saying when the car is on the left side of uh, this environment, move to the right. So if like really quickly, if you think about it, that makes sense. The policy is thinking, oh, our goal, is on the, our goal is on the right side, but the car is on the left side, so let's move to the right. That makes sense, right? But it's kind of inefficient because what it's doing is inhibiting the car to use that left hill. Because if the car is on the, on the uh, left side of the hill, the velocity part of this policy is telling it to keep moving left. Let's go all the way up that hill so we can gain as much uh, momentum as possible when we go back down it. But the position part of this policy is counteracting that and saying, oh no, we're on the left side, we need to go to the right, and going back to the right. So it's, there's, a, there's a, a strange interaction going on here that I want to try and fix. So I, when, I, when I realized this, I sort of hypothesized that this strange interaction had to do with the current reward system, the current reward system or current reward function for the, the mountain car game. So again, by default, it's just returning a reward of negative one for every step we take that doesn't succeed. So what this means is that the agent is not rewarded at all until it reaches a success point. And at that point, the game is done. So the, the car is really ne never getting positively rewarded for taking good actions. It's really just getting negatively rewarded over and over and over. So even if the car got close or made good progress in the problem, it's still negatively rewarded. So because this, because the reward stays constant throughout the throughout an episode, just like it's always negative one, it's impossible for our policy to really improve that much until the car randomly reaches the top for the first time. So that's why the policy took a few hundred episodes to really uh, start showing significant improvements. So we have an idea of why this re this reward function is uh, is inefficient. So take a second here, think about like possible approaches you might use to improve it. Uh, maybe pause the video, try to implement something, and then come back um, and see if see if see what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to try and do something better here. So, a quick hint for those of you that are actually trying to think of a better reward function: 
We know that we're able to retrieve the car's current position and current velocity sorry, from that observation object that OpenAI returns us. Recall that in the observation vector, the position comes first and then its velocity. So think about how you can use that information to improve the reward function. Can we, re can we uh, reward the agent for at least moving in the right direction? Or maybe reward it for gaining energy, like potential energy maybe for going up the hill, or kinetic energy for moving really fast, which will allow it to have enough momentum to go all the way up? So try a few things. Unpause the video when, you, when, you've, uh, when you've given up, basically, um, and I'm going to show you what I did. So before we retrain this, the first thing you got to make sure you do is reset your queue table. You don't want to like override what we've learned so far. Let's just start from scratch. So we're erasing everything the agent learned so far. Re-instantiate our, our queue value is all to be zero. So what I've done here is you'll see that this is the exact same code snippet from above. Just copy and paste it. Works exactly the same. But here I have updated our reward a little bit. So rather than using the reward that the environment returns us, that OpenAI gym returns us, let's override that and create our own reward function. So I'm going to run this while I, ex I explain our reward function. So what I did is I replaced OpenAI's, OpenAI gym's reward function uh, to now be the mechanical energy gained from taking an action. So once again, if you're at a current state and take an action, my reward function is now the total mechan the mechanical energy that the car gained from moving from one state to the other. If you're not familiar with mechanical energy, mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic energy uh, plus potential energy. Potential energy, um, hmm. my explanations are going to get a bit funky here. But like potential energy, you gain potential energy from moving farther away from Earth's surface. So if you're higher up on a hill, you have more potential energy. And kinetic energy is gained from having a higher velocity. So the faster the car moves, the more kinetic energy this will gain. So by adding these two up, we're taking both into account how fast the car is going, going and how high up the car is. So if you combine these, these will allow the car to learn to either accelerate to maximum acceleration or move as high as possible so that you have a lot of potential energy. So you don't really want to use either one of these. Like you don't want to use only kinetic energy because if you train the, if you use a reward function that's only based on kinetic energy, the car will learn to maximize its velocity, which isn't what we always want to do because sometimes even while the car is moving up a hill, like moving up the left hill, it's going to be slowly losing velocity because of gravity, but we're actually going to want it to keep trying to go as high as possible so that at some point when it finally re loses momentum, it's as high as possible, which means when it goes back down, it'll reach a, lot, a really high velocity. So that's why we want the car to, to try and maximize both potential energy and kinetic energy at the same time. So when the car is moving up a hill, it's going to try and go as far as uh, as possible up that hill to try and get a lot of potential energy and when the car starts falling back down the hill it's going to try and accelerate as fast as possible to gain a lot of kinetic energy and hopefully uh, maximizing that velocity will allow the car to move all the way up that last hill and succeed. So because we're actually given the velocity and position calculating kinetic and potential energy is straightforward. So if you just google the kinetic energy equation it's just one half uh, times the velocity squared, which is easily implemented here. So I just calculate the kinetic energy that the car had before taking this step and the kinetic energy that the car has now after taking this action. And same thing for potential energy. Potential energy, I believe, is mass times the gravitational constant times the car's current height. So we don't actually know what planet this car is on, so I just assumed, I just like make this gravitational constant one, so I got rid of that. Um, and then we're also not explicitly given the car's current height. We're only given the car's position on the x-axis. Um, but we can use, we can sort of like guess the slope of this hill. Where's a, where's a mountain? 
We can sort of like guess the slopes of the the hill slope, and then if we know the slope and know the position, we can use some trigonometry to calculate the height. So that's what I'm doing here with uh, the sine function from NumPy. I'm just sort of roughly roughly estimating um, what height the car is at, and then I think I misspoke. I think I ended up using a Oh, okay, so this is either the mass of the car or the gravitational constant, just like to, to just to sort of offset the height a little bit. So we're sort of calculating like a rough potential energy here. It doesn't matter too much. Really, all we want to take into account is the car's height. So what we have now is the kinetic energy of the car before and after taking a step, and same with the potential of the car before and after taking a step. So the reward is the total mechanical energy of the car after taking a step minus the total mechanical energy of the car before taking that step. And then I just multiply that by 100. So that's our, our reward now. The total mechanical energy gained from taking a step. So if I run that, I should have been running it this whole time. But it shouldn't take too long. Let's give it a second here. So... Hopefully you guys have like an intuition or a general idea of why this reward function might do a little bit better. Like before the reward function wasn't telling the agent how good it was doing at all. It wasn't giving any useful feedback. Like every time the car stepped in, stepped in a direction, no matter how smart of a move that was, it still got a reward of negative one. So it wasn't giving any like preliminary feedback into how it was doing. So now that we're using mechanical energy as a reward function, the car is going to be rewarded for either moving really fast or moving up a hill. So both of those are good things for the car when trying to succeed in this environment. And that should be done now, so let's plot how we do. Oops, I think I did run it from before. Okay, we're gonna have to write one more time for this. My bad, guys. Because I hadn't reset any of the variables from up here, so it sort of like counted them twice. I thought, well, that's why we have a success rate of almost 200%, which is not correct. Let's wait a second here. One thing I want you guys to do while you watch this workshop is really try and notice the similarity, or not similarity, because it's the exact same algorithm, but make the connection between how I coded this algorithm and the actual algorithm written out up here. And you'll see that if you can make that connection, if you can see where we get the current Q value from, where we get the expected reward one step in the future from, and then also the reward and learning rate and all that stuff, if you can make that connection, this will make a lot more sense to you guys. And also the fact that a Q value represents the expected reward for taking an action from a current state. Those two things are really important. That's all you need to implement Q learning. And this pretty simple algorithm can be used to solve a lot, a lot of problems. Okay, so now we're done. You'll see that we reach a success rate of nearly 90%. So it's about, what, 3% better than before? So it's slightly better than before in terms of success rate. But the real benefit of our new reward function isn't quite shown in these plots. You'll see that the learning is a bit smoother, I would say. It requires, I'd say, a few, like, 100 less maybe episodes, maybe 200 less episodes until it flattens out. So that's a good thing. It seems to learn in the efficient policy a little bit quicker. And then this curve is totally flat. So this policy is a lot more intelligent. This is what's that tell telling us. Right here, we're succeeding literally every single time after like the th 300th episode. Whereas if you look here with our bad reward function, there are some weird cases where the car didn't succeed. And that is due to our sort of like weird... Uh, policy that we've learned like it's a bit funky you'll see that like it's spread out a bit weirdly there's a there's like not a good trend going on here so when we plot our new policy this is where we're going to really see why this is doing a little bit better the reward too it's a lot flatter so you can see that the learning is a bit more stable we have a few more successes and we'll see that our policy once we plot it here in a second is it way improved. So you can see how much cleaner this new policy is. We've, we've really got rid of that weird interaction between position and the, the 
policy is the most important bit. So this now this policy is uh, like way more dependent on velocity, which is actually what we want. We we want the car to always be trying to move in the direction that it's currently moving in. Like if it's moving to the left, keep moving to the left up that left hill to gain momentum. And it's moving to the right, keep moving to the right to try and reach the goal, obviously. And before, we had that weird interaction with position, where if it was on the left side, it was trying to move to the right a little bit. So that is what we wanted to get rid of, which we did. So you can see that now it's a lot cleaner. When the car is moving to the right, which is a positive velocity on the top half of this graph, it's always, almost always telling it to move to the right. And on the bottom half, we see pretty much a big field of blue, which is good. That means when the car's velocity is negative or to the left, the policy is telling us to move to the left as well. So you can see how much cleaner this new policy is now. It's, it's a lot more clean, a lot more efficient. Uh, there's no weird interaction going on now. It could probably be a little bit better, uh, but it's definitely a step up from our previous policy. So if you look at this visualization here, this is pretty much uh, what our car is doing now. So we'll start with, it's already started. Let me wait for it to restart once more. So it starts off at the bottom here, and it just slowly moves up to the left, as far as it can to the right, as far as it can to the left, and then now it has no momentum to succeed. So that's exactly what this policy is letting us do. It's, it's saying, drive as far up a hill as possible. When momentum starts to fade, then, only then do you move all the way back down the hill, and we want to accelerate down that hill. We don't want to be slowing down. We want to be accelerating down that hill as fast as we can. Um, one thing to note is you see some strange uh, policy decisions on the borders here. Like pretty much every state that's on the border is blue. So the reason that is is that zero is our uh, default action because that's action number zero. Um, and these states, the car simply never reaches them. Like recall that position 0.5 is success but the car can theoretically actually reach 0.6. So we have states in our Q table that are at 0.6, although the car will never reach those because the environment stops the game the second the car reaches 0.5. So it'll never really reach like 0.6. That's why up here, uh, this policy is all blue, all to the left, because that's sort of our default, our default decision and we never learn anything other than that. And same thing with velocity. We could theoretically reach these really high velocities, but I think the just the number of times the car reaches the maximum velocity is pretty low. And if the agent while playing the game doesn't reach a certain state or reaches that state very few times, we're obviously going to update that Q value very few times. So it's not going to have learned much. So that's why if you look at the edge of this policy, it's mostly all blue. It's just because the agent never learned much about those uh, sort of edge edge case states. It just never reached those states that much, so never learned much about them. So that concludes our reinforcement learning workshop. Um, hopefully you guys learned a little bit. This is one of my favorite workshops to give just because it can actually be visualized like this in a really cool way and we can really see. I mean, this is almost like visualizing the car's brain. Like it's, this is visualizing what the car is thinking based off every state it could possibly be in. So if you want to try and prove it, you guys could try to work on the hyperparameters a little bit, which are defined all the way up here. You can try out different, different learning rates. Uh, different ways to, to update epsilon over time, so maybe try and exploit the policy sooner, or maybe try and exploit the policy later on rather than earlier. Um, where is what I'm looking for? Yeah, you can try and up, work on different gammas. The coolest thing about OpenAI Gym is that this is just one of the environments. There are a lot of really cool environments that are just as simple as this. Like There are complica complicated ones as well. Um, that would require some more complicated RL algorithms, but there are, I would say, at least like five or six, maybe ten, that can all be solved using Q-learning. So if you have some spare time during quarantine, clone this notebook. Uh, here, when you create the environment, you just pass a different environment name, and all of the other uh, OpenAI gym methods and attributes that we used are all the same across all the environments. So you would still step with an action in the same way. You still it still returns a state, reward, and done variable the same way. So you guys can really pr play around with any of the OpenAI gym environments if you'd like. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. Hope you guys enjoyed. Um, stay safe. Stay healthy out there. Um, 
trying to stay home as much as possible. Uh, this thing got like really crazy really fast, so hopefully everything goes back to normal soon here. I don't think it's looking too good for us. But uh, thank you guys for your time. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, last thing, we do have a, I think at the beginning of our, my slides there, I put a... A sign-in sheet. I know we're not meeting in person now that this whole thing has happened, but if you guys could still fill out that sign-out sheet or sign-in sheet, sorry, it'd be awesome just so we can still continue to get feedback in regard to really just how many people are actually watching these online lectures because a lot of our coordinators are still putting a lot of effort into generating these online lectures, so we want to make sure that people are still watching them and we're not just making these videos for no one to watch. So, again, thank you guys for your time. Hope you guys enjoyed. Clone the notebook. Get a different gym environment and try it out. It's a lot of fun. Open AI Gym is awesome. Um, have a good day, guys. See you later. Bye-bye.